Uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce Eos uh, from Duke University. Uh, he's a graduating PhD student and uh, he's on the job market this year. Uh, he has done some excellent work on differential privacy and SQL, and today he's going to tell us more about that. Okay, thanks, Anardan. <clears throat> so, hello, everybody. As Anardan said, my name is Eos. I come from Duke University, and as the title suggests, today I'm going to talk about uh, how you can build a differential private uh, interface on top of uh, a traditional SQL uh, database. Okay. Uh, first, in this talk, I'm going to in introduce and motivate the problem and convince you that it's it's a real problem that we don't have good solutions for. Then I'm going to go to the technical part of the talk where I'm going to uh, describe the architecture of our system and give you some key insights on why wh what we do different and why it is better. And then I'm going to show some experiments based on uh, U real US census data and <clears throat> real queries that the census wants to release. And lastly, if we have time, we can talk a little bit about um, uh, what we do right now and what we want to do in the future uh, going from this work, okay? <coughs> so, we live in a, in a, in a world where uh, we're powered from data and we're from our phone and uh, we get um, notifications about our flight and so on. And generally we have organizations that collect data about in individuals and uh, <coughs> others, uh, other releases data based on this, uh, based the, the organizations either release data or they use the data to create us uh, with, uh, with great uh, value, like um, when we have predictive machine learning algorithms, right? And usually this data uh, resides in traditional databases. Okay. We'll take one example, which is the US Census. They do the decennial census every 10 years. And they collect uh, data from every person, and then they have uh, different data products. Based on this uh, data, we can ha we have a congressional appoint apportionment, redistricting, and so forth. Okay. And uh, for the but this data now for the census, there is there is always the risk of privacy. But specifically for the census, and this is also encoded in legislature that the data needs the data release needs to satisfy certain privacy guarantees. Okay. And if we see the example of the summary file one data release that they have. Uh, they have queries like this, counting queries like this, which, okay, we're not going to read SQL right now. Uh, they count number of households that where the householder, these households uh, fit certain properties. In this, this uh, a query counts number of households with the householder is in a certain age, and they have one child under 18, and so on. <coughs> okay. So what do we do for privacy? In, uh, in academia, differential privacy has emerged as the golden standard. <laughs> And it is so celebrated because it gives very clear uh, privacy semantics. Informally, it tells us that the output of a differential private mechanism should mask the presence or absence of any single tuple in the data set. And when these tuples, it, these tuples correspond to individuals, then this can hide uh, individuals as well. Okay. And this is captured from this neighboring uh, relation over here, where we say that for every two neighboring relationships and in neighboring data sets and neighboring data sets differ in one tuple. Okay. <clears throat> it also has some very nice properties. Most, uh, I'm going to stick with just two of them, post-processing and composition. Post-processing tells us that the output of any differential private algorithm can be, can be used uh, without any additional privacy loss. Okay. And composition tells us that if we run multiple uh, algorithms, it tells us how the privacy guarantee degrades. Okay, and these are some details. Again, not necessary right now. So usually, differential private algorithms work by uh, adding calibrated noise to query answers. So you have your privacy firewall, you have your data analyst outside, and he submits some queries, and he gets noisy answers back. And generally, this noise is calibrated both to the epsilon parameter, with high values of epsilon mean less noise and less privacy, but also the sensitivity of the query, where the sensitivity is, uh, <coughs> is defined as this formula over there, and captures the maximum difference of a query answer for any two neighboring uh, data sets. Okay. Now let's talk about this neighboring relation now, because so long in, in, in differential privacy, you have a flat table, so defining neighbor data sets is very simple. You add or remove a tuple, and then you measure the sensitivity of the query, you measure everything. 
So what does it mean if you have a schema? You have just people and households, okay? What does it mean to have a neighboring <coughs> database? Do I add a row in household? Do I add a row in person? Do I what, what, what does it mean exactly? So this one challenge, if we want to do differential privacy for relational data, this is the first challenge that we need to tackle, okay? And this <coughs> brings us to, to the goal of, of, of this system, is that we want to build a system that uh, gives a nice interface that uh, analysts can ask declarative queries like SQL on a database, answers all these queries under a common privacy budget, so that means that analysts, in practice, this means that analysts can collude with each other and not gain additional information. And we want the data owner to specify the privacy requirements. So the data owner is, is, the, is the person who will say, okay, person is my, is my private relation here. And this is a simple schema with only two relations, but you can have like bigger schema. Again, you would like to have the data owner to specify the resolution of privacy, okay. Now let's see <clears throat> what we can do with uh, prior work. Okay, one solution is uh, the, the Uber work, the flex, where the analyst submits one query at a time, and he runs a differential, the, a differential private algorithm runs for this query, and he gets an answer back, okay? And he does this uh, unlimited times, right? So, <clears throat> as you understand from the sequential composition, uh, either our privacy budget stops, and stops at some point, so we need to stop answering queries, or we have unbounded privacy laws because we continue answering queries. So this is the first problem with this approach. Another problem with this approach that doesn't violate privacy but it is a problem from user experience point of view is that there is no consistency between query answers. What do I mean by that? Imagine if I submit the same query twice in this, in this system, I will get two different answers. So there is no consistency because of the randomness of the algorithms. And maybe you can cast, you will tell me, okay, maybe we can cast the same query, right? Okay, but then you ask a query about the population in North Carolina, you ask the query about population in, um, um, in coastal North Carolina, right? And you want one to be smaller than the other, you can't cast it there, and there's no guarantee that it will be consistent, okay? Sorry, consistency, is it across the queries or for the same query? It should be across the queries, right? So imagine that I ask what is the population of men, what's the population of women, what is the total population? There is implied consistency there, right? Like I have like three counts, they should add up to, have two counts, they should add up to the other count, right? And generally, like that, these are two examples, you can have consistency, like more complex consistency. So is that a goal of your work, is consistency? Uh, we, we get consistency for free, as we'll see later. Okay. I mean, we, we get, we, we get, take consistency for free because we don't do this. We do something closer to this, okay? Consistency has been looked at. I mean, it's something the centers keep. No, no, I, I, th I think it's, it's central with uh, online query answering. I think consensus is a central point with, like, one, uh, with this model. Of a yeah, privacy. It, it, no, 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 not, not specifically for flex. Any system that does one query at a time will have the consistency problem. I mean, yeah, just there are techniques to address it. There are papers on like how yeah. to address this consistency issue. Yeah, like sensors and yeah, this this is a common issue. And, yeah. yeah. The second the second model that we can do to do query answering is that um, we can have we can have one algorithm that creates synthetic data and we'll create synthetic versions of the base tables here. And uh, then the, <clears throat> the analyst will submit queries to this synthetic data over there and not to the real data. And here, obviously, we get constant privacy loss for unlimited number of queries. It follows from post-processing that this thing will, will be true. And uh, we get consistency for free here, again, no matter how complex our queries are. Okay. However, this has another problem, and uh, it's that if you have, if the analyst submits queries, and these queries have joins of between the base tables, and we try to do the joins based on the synthetic base tables, we'll, we'll incur a very high error. The intuition behind this is that differential privacy tries to mask the presence or absence of any individual. And when you have joins, we join on IDs or, or, or quasi-identifiers. And these IDs now correspond to a single individual, quasi-identifiers correspond to a small uh, subset of individuals. 
So <clears throat> that is the intuition why we'll incur very high noise here, OK? So this brings us back now to, to our goal, right? Again, we'd like to build a system that doesn't have these problems, and again, has like these three desiderata. We have like uh, complex SQL queries on the database that might have joins, might have group bias, and so on. Common privacy budget for all of them. And uh, again, privacy requirements from the data owner. OK. And now, before, before I describe our system, I want to discuss a little bit about certain principles that uh, we had before uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the decision making for building the private SQL. OK. Uh, first, we want to avoid the online query answering uh, uh, problems. And we do that by releasing private synopsis. So it's synthetic data, but we will call them synopsis because they might not be tuples. They might be histograms or vectors of counts and so on. Okay. And this, of course, as we said earlier, gives us constant privacy loss and um, it prevents from side timing attacks, consistency. It, it, it's, it's a decision that we made that we're not going to go online. We're going to be that model. But as we said earlier, uh, if, we, if we go that way, we have a big loss on uh, joins. So our synopsis are not going to be on the base tables. They're going to be on the overviews of the schema. OK. And these views it, themselves encode the joins. And lastly, the views need to be driven from some workload, some idea of what, work, what will the analyst ask on the actual at, at query time. Okay. Uh, we know that we can't answer all queries with high accuracy as in strong privacy guarantees. So we can't ho so we hope to have like a representative workload and try from this representative workload to capture the views okay that will drive our uh, will build our synopsis okay. Also we have, we have a cider submission that it's out uh, where we have more uh, more discussion on, on the design principles uh, behind private SQL. okay. Saying that you will not answer it online, but we'll have a private synopsis. Is it similar to like synthetic data, or is it? Yeah. So um, it will look like this. Okay. So generally, you have an you have an offline uh, mode where you we have an offline phase where you generate your synopsis. Okay. You generate your private synopsis, and then the synopsis now are outside the firewall, and you have a query answer, a query, a query answering engine. I'm sorry. A query answering engine that intercepts SQL, maps it to the correct synopsis, and gives an answer. So, yes, the private synopsis generate the green box, which are the the private uh, synopsis, and these are driven, these are tuned to the representative workload, which is Q, and uh, also we correctly satisfy the guarantees, the P comma epsilon guarantees, from the from the data owner, and I will explain a P. P is like the primary private relation. It's the private privacy object, and epsilon is what what the budget. Okay. And then, after we have released the synopsis, then we have the query engine that correctly uh, intercepts the SQL and that answers the the queries. Now, it will be the case that we might have certain queries incoming from the analyst that cannot be answered from from this synopsis, and we do not address this. We just tell the analyst, okay, we cannot answer this query at this point in time. Okay. And we can come back to this later and discuss maybe what we can do. Okay. <clears throat> now for the remainder of the talk, I'm not I'm gonna talk only about the synopsis generation phase, okay? So it looks kinda like this inside the box. Okay, we have five different components and they all work in tan tandem to get you from data and privacy requirements and representative workload to private synopsis. Okay, so let's see how this happens. First, you have our view selector. Okay, that takes as input uh, the representative workload and generates a set of views based on this workload. Okay, the main idea here is that we want for each a query of the representative workload, we want to capture its uh, its joint structure and have a view that encodes this joint structure. At the end, after the view selector has, has run, every single query of the representative workload 
can be rewritten as a linear query on some of the views that we generated. And this will be crucial later on when we actually run the differential private algorithms. That will help us a lot if you have linear queries for these views. Okay. So this is basically just creating materialized views for like any set of joins that you see in the workload. Yeah. Okay. Uh, joins and group buys and other non-linearities that and appear in the workload. Okay. okay. And uh, we'll also deal with uh, correlated subqueries. So we know how to decorrelate them. There is uh, this old work, but we actually do it. Okay. And uh, we, we capture like this view selector has a limited grammar. So we don't support all of SQL. But we support in enough SQL, I think. Okay. Is there some kind of prioritization that happens, or do you just go through the representative workload and just do everything? What, what, what do you mean exactly by prioritization? Well, like if there's, if there's some that appear a lot, but then there's one join syntax that appears only three times in the representative workload, like is that? Yeah, that, that, that matters, but not here. OK. That matters, but not there. So I'm going to spoil it a little bit and tell you that, yes, you might have only one query that has this join structure, right? So that will create, will create one view. And that one view can answer only one query. So that gray guy, the budget allocator there, might want to give less weight to that one view okay. at, at the point where we, we yeah. put budget. But when we select views, our, our goal is that every single query from the representative, we want to create a view that can answer that query. And we have certain heuristics, but I'm not going to go into too much detail about the view selector in, uh, during the talk. <clears throat> but I'm going to go into more detail about these two guys, OK? So the goal of the view rewrite and the sensitivity calculator, fancy names, is that for every single view, we want to compute the correct sensitivity bounds with respect to the policy specified from the data owner, OK? And this can be tricky. And we have two different algorithms working together, OK? After these two algorithms work, for every view, we have a sensitivity bound. And after we have a sensitivity bound for every view, we can allocate our total budget across views. So now every view um, has, has epsilon, I, epsilon over the sensitivity times some row. And that row is how we decide to split our budget. And maybe we wanted to put more budget, and actually this is what we do, in, uh, in views that, that capture many queries. And this is a strategy for the instantiation of the budget allocator. Okay. And after that, our life is pretty easy. Because now, we, what do we have? We have a view VI, a materialized view VI in the data D, a QI, which is the partial workload for that, for that view, and an epsilon i, where epsilon i is the, is the epsilon after we take account the sensitivity. So we can use any differential private algorithm, like from prior work, that works for uh, linear queries. And we can get a materialized synopsis. And we call them synopsis because they really can be anything that this algorithm outputs. So if, that al if this algorithm outputs synthetic tuples, like brief base here, we have synthetic tuples. If it outputs a vector of counts, like DAWA, we have a vector of counts, and so on. And I promised I'm going to talk about this, about sensitivity calculation in more detail. So let's go back to the previous slide and see what is sensitivity, a sensitivity of a, of a symbol. This is a very simple query that counts number of people of voting age. And try to see what is the sensitivity of this query in our relational data that it's also very simple. It has only two tables, OK? As a reminder, this is the formula for sensitivity. And let's see. Uh, how are we going to choose our, our policy, right? Let's say that um, we just do differential privacy standard, so we had to remove a person. We had to remove a person. So if we, this is what Flex does. So they just differ. We just take neighboring relations that they differ in one table. And um, if they differ in in persons, you, you compute the sensitivity. It's one. Okay. I can either add the person of voting age or not. Okay. So this count will change at most one. Now. What if I had to remove a household? OK. So if I had to remove a household, this query doesn't change, right? Because I just had to remove household and touch the, the person's table. The query doesn't change. We get sensitivity 0. OK. But we can all understand that this is not what should happen in reality, because we see that this house over there has like this 
these two people living there. So if I, if I remove this house, then my sensitivity should be two, not zero. So this happens because you have like these foreign key constraints where we remove something from one relation, from the primary private relation, and other stuff are removed as well. And this is not captured from saying just this thing that neighboring if they differ in one table. This doesn't capture it. So to cap... I, I, sorry, I don't understand this. Because these are different databases. They are related because they share some keys. But that query is for people with the above certain age. That has nothing to do with Auzor, right? Because why do you want... Because no, no, the, the, these, are, these are not different databases. These are different tables in the same database. Okay, so if I want to hide the presence of, of a household, okay. and, and I just give this count, mm -hmm. right? This, this will break the privacy of the households. Let's say that the adversary knows that. Um, no, I, I mean, at least for this query, it's about the question, right? Because maybe these people just lost their houses. They are still there. Mm -hmm. so should I not uh, account for them? The thing I is mean, that I understand that maybe there is. If you, want to if you want to hide the presence of a house, right? Mm -hmm. And you just re release queries on persons, mm -hmm. you still need to add noise to them. Because then your adversary will know what is the distribution, for example, of people in houses and might you know, reconstruct the house table. Okay. Not that. Yeah, you can ask many, many queries to do that, but I just don't see why. Yes, I mean. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Maybe I, I it will be Let, let's, see, let's see if, if this will convince you a little bit better, right? So we have the, these key constraints, right? And the key constraints tell you that this, uh, these two tables are, are connected like that, right? Then if we, if we de de decide that our primary private relation is the red guy, is the house, then to find the neighbors, we also need to keep track of all changes in, in the other private relations, in the other, in the other relations. So how, how, we, how we define privacy here is that we say uh, for, for a policy, and the policy is what is the primary private relation, first we're going to find what are the secondary private relations. And in this example, it's only one. But if I have a bigger schema, with, uh, it can be a chain, it can have like a diamond, we find all the other orands, which are the secondary private relations. Okay. And then to define neighboring data set, databases, we not only keep track of changes in household, but we also keep track changes in the other relations as well with uh, transitive deletions. Okay. Which one? So, so yeah, like this one. So would you? I mean, you like basically in in any way, if you want to handle this thing, I mean, you have to impose the limit on the number of people that can live in a single household. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah, I'll explain how we do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is unbounded, right? The sensitivity here, if you want to, either you know a priori what is the na maximum number of people in households in North Carolina, whatever, it's 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why, but it's 20. Uh, or you need to do it privately. Okay, and we did it privately. So, sorry, what is 20? The, 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 the multiplicity of uh, HID. Oh, so the number of people... I have one household, I have one household in North Carolina with 20 people inside, yeah. I don't know what to do with that household. <laughs> So, <laughs> it's not maximally revealed, it's a hard coded constraint saying that it cannot be more than 20. Yeah, but how do you know that 20 without looking at the data? Yeah. This is the question, right? Yeah, I think you have to, you have to put in a hard constraint yourself. I mean, like, where can it come from? But I, we, we deal with it. I'll, I will, a uh, couple of slides later on, we'll, we'll see how, how we can deal with that. This, we call it max frequency, uh, and uh, we have a way to deal with it. Okay. So this is how we define privacy. Okay. Privacy now is not only defined on an epsilon, but a rho comma epsilon, where rho, r, I'm sorry, r, is, a, is the primary private relation. Okay. A caveat here is that the schema needs to be acyclic. If I have cycles in my schema, this doesn't work anymore. Okay. And uh, we can now, now with this in mind, we can go back to how we would do sensitivity. Okay. So we have three main issues to, to deal to deal with. First of all is that um, our view is a complex SQL query, and even estimation of sensitivity for that is, is, is a hard problem. OK, that's one. Second is what Sergey hinted is that you need to know this frequency. And if you don't know it, then the global sensitivity will be unbounded in the presence of joins. And lastly, whatever sensitivity, whatever calculation we, we make, 
is always going to be dependent on the privacy resolution, on what is the primary private relation. Because if, if I have like household primary private relation, then I need a different program based on if, if, with, if I had person primary private relation. Okay. So this is how we deal with them. Uh, for the first thing, we have a rule-based sensitivity estimator, calculator, that builds on top of Flex. For the second, uh, we, we have a truncation technique where we truncate uh, outliers. And for the last, we have an automatic policy enforcement from the view rewriting module, OK? And now I'm going to just talk about the, the first bullet, like how we you compute sensitivity. And we also have an example, OK? So we have a bottom-up rule-based algorithm that works on query plans. Query plans look like this green box, uh, the second green box. So you have a, you have a SQL view, and that green box and it captures that that view. And uh, we have additional rules. So we build on top of the flex rules that compute the elastic sensitivity, but we have additional rules that give us even tighter bounds. Okay, and we do so that the main idea there is that we track keep track of what attribute is a key. Okay, so let's see how it would work. Okay. So you have this view, it translates to this query plan. And really, what is it? It creates a table. Uh, every row corresponds to a person. The first is whether the person is uh, the head of the household or the spouse or a child and so on. The second is the race. And the third is the number of people in his household, the, 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 the total number of people in the household that he lives in. Okay. So we can see that this has a self-join here. Okay. And a group by. So the group by is gamma. The self join is over there, OK? So let's see how the algorithm would work. Uh, and, and my primary, uh, primary private relation is person here, OK? So first, uh, it would go and mark the sensitivity of its person uh, relation as 1, because they're the primary private relations. And now the sensitivity on them is 1. I had to remove a tuple on them, OK? And then to compute the, the group by, we double the sensitivity that was underneath the, the group by, and we get 2, OK? At the same time, HID, where we do the group by on, now becomes a key for, for relation R. Okay, so there is, a, there is a relation R after the group by, and now for that relation, HID becomes a key. Okay. And now we perform the join. And because the join is on a, a key attribute, we have an, a different formula that gives us at the end a 2 times F plus 1, where F is the multiplicity of HID in person, OK? So the sensitivity is still dependent on, uh, on the actual data. OK, we'll see how we get rid of that a little bit later, OK? Now, if we didn't have this new rule, and if we didn't keep track of, of the keys, the sensitivity would be 3 times f plus 2, OK? And this difference here might be very small. 2, two times f plus 1, it's, it's like the difference is small. But as we add joins and group buys in our query plans, and self-joins and so on, uh, this difference becomes larger, okay? The, fact, the factor of difference becomes larger, and this can get, get out of hand really quickly for more complex queries, okay? So this is our sensitivity calculator. And one problem here with, with this sensitivity calculator is what happens if we change the privacy policy? What happens if now person from red becomes orange, right? It becomes a secondary private relation. If, if you run the algorithm like this here, we'll get zero, okay? And we don't want to get zero. It, it would be wrong. So we, we either need a different algorithm, a different sensitivity calculator to run for every different policy. And maybe if you have only two policies, this is OK. But in the general case, it's not OK. Or you can automatically enforce policies, OK? <clears throat> and here, the main idea is that we have this view rewriting module that runs before the sensitivity calculator, takes as input the query plan, and outputs an, an equivalent query plan such that when the sensitivity calculator runs, we'll compute the correct uh, sensitivity. And it does so by adding semi-join operators whenever a secondary private relation appears. Okay. So by adding these semi-joins, essentially the sensitivity calculator updates the base um, sensitivity for these uh, tables correctly. Okay. Let's let's see an example. Okay. I have an even simpler query now. It's a, a table with all people avoiding age, OK? And my policy is household. So what the view writer would do, so what the sensitivity calculator would do 
without any rewriting would compute 0. OK. But we're going to add a semi-join operator there. OK. So we don't, we add in the query plan a semi-join between household and person wherever we see the person. OK. And now our sensitivity calculator correctly will compute the sensitivity of this query plan as f, where f is the, the, um, the max frequency of HID in person. OK. And this is the max frequency off of the data after the summary join? Now, <clears throat> but we're still not super good, right? Because there is a dependency on f here. Like you need to look at the data. Okay. So the second thing that our view rewriter does is that it gets rid of the max frequency. Okay. So we have this sensitivity calculator that gives us a result that is dependent on the on the on some true data statistics. Okay. This means that now the, the whatever bound this sensitivity calculator gives us is a bound for local sensitivity. If we do local sensitivity, we have to do smoothing, we have problems down the line. Okay. We don't want to do that. We want to have a bound for global sensitivity. So the main idea is unbounded. Yes, but we want to bound the global sensitivity. Okay. So how, how do you do that? Right? So this the, the idea is very simple, is that we're gonna add carefully some truncation operators in the query plan. Okay. We'll see what this means, but essentially we enforce independency from f, and now the dependency is only on the truncation operator. Okay, let, let's see an example. This this is our query plan before doing the truncation, but after doing the semi join, and this would be our query plan uh, after the the truncation. Okay, so what do I do? I go to person and I truncate HID in person at level k. Okay. We can talk offline how we do K. It's not super difficult, okay? How do we get K? I mean, because we do SVT and we get K. What is that? We do sparse variable technique and we get we get we do we get K under differential privacy. But let's forget how you get K and let's say that somebody gives you K. Okay. In, in general, is K bigger than the local or smaller than the local? It's it's, the, it's smaller. I mean that. Okay. In general, in general, the mechanism that you have. Uh, gives a k that it's smaller. Okay. You could build other mechanism that give a k that it's larger. Uh, I don't think that to, how to select k is super important. The main idea that I want to to communicate is that whatever sensitivity that we have now is not dependent on the true data; is dependent on k. So if if k, if you look at the true data to get k, then you're still in local sensitivity. But if you put k arbitrarily on your own, now it's global sensitivity. Similarly, if you look at the data under differential privacy and picked a reasonably good k, you're still uh, bound for global sensitivity. And the main theorem in our paper shows that if you do both operations, then you have the correct global sensitivity count for the, co for the um, privacy resolution specified from the data owner. OK. No, sorry. I think this point I also don't understand. I mean, let me ask a dumb question first. So is this k just like I can think of it as hard coding? I will not look at the data and just say. Yeah, you could you could do it like that. You could do it like that. Yeah. But that's. Yeah, we don't do it like that. But this is the principle. This tells you how you move from a sensitivity calculator that does local to a sensitivity calculator that does global. No, I mean just saying that is not enough, right? Because there are many ways I could get around this local. Just hard coding is one such method. But it should be that it like. It should still capture because local sensitivity is what is the best you can do. But as you said, like it leads to technical problems. So somehow it should be a good approximation to it, but still, like you know, it behaves like a global sensitivity. That's what we really want. Right. And you are saying that there is such a way to one one way to do it. Exactly, you're right. One way to do it is with truncation. There might be other ways to do it. I see. So my question is just what does truncation mean in this context? Okay. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe that would be more helpful. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so what does truncation operator does, right? So it goes to person table, and it has a level k, and has an attribute hid, okay? And goes and drops all tuples from persons whose hid has frequency larger than k. So in my North Carolina data that I have one household with 20 people, and 99% of households with at most five, our, my, our algorithm will most of the times choose five and will drop the 1% of the data. And now 
I added bias to my problem, but I reduced the variance because now my, my sensitivity is smaller. So you don't just drop too many people in the household? Drop I, dropped, I dropped all the people that are in this household side. I dropped them. I, I, like if you ask a query about these people, you're going to get a very high error. This is, this is a drawback of this uh, approach. But it's something that we need to live with because now we have very good accuracy on everybody else, on every other query. <laughs> <coughs> needed to decide on this number five without looking at the distribution. I look, I look at the data under differential privacy. I have a sparse vector technique algorithm mm -hmm. initiated with a query that essentially asks uh, for max frequency equal to i, for frequency equal to i and uh, for frequency at most i, what is the number of, uh, what is the portion of data that have frequency at most i? Now this query we've shown that it has sensitivity i. Okay, so if you divide this query by i, you get sensitivity 1, and you can have many such queries for many different i's. You give them to sparse vector technique, which is an algorithm that will return only one time when you cross the threshold. It adds noise to both the threshold and the true, uh, <coughs> and, the, and the query answer, and it gives you a threshold at the end. Loss in your overall yeah, that, but that's a one-time thing you yeah, do. Well, okay. yeah. And the other one is that if you do this, if I understand correctly, I mean, there is a likelihood that it can, it can like, if you want to get, say, 99% percentile, since you are getting a noisy answer, you might get, say, 98% percentile. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, I mean, that is a problem, yeah. And that, like, I mean, so you don't really know, like, how much... Uh, no, you don't really know, no. And, and you have to live with it because either you're gonna go and pay. So this is a bias, a, a bias variance trade-off, because you're gonna choose a, a truncation level. The the smaller your truncation level, the bigger the bias that you add to your data because you dropped a lot of tuples. Okay. But the smaller the truncation level, the better the the max frequency estimations are gonna be because here here the the sensitivity excuse me the sensitivity estimation is gonna be because here the sensitivity is gonna be k, right? So if if I if my as as my as my truncation becomes smaller, the noise that I need to add becomes uh, also smaller, but I pay in, in in bias. It it is it it is um yeah it is interesting how to to do these things correctly. For <clears throat> for the time being, sparse vector technique with the query that we found uh, works nicely because the query is also very low sensitivity, and uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have any other questions about the technical stuff because I'm going to move to the to the experiments now. <clears throat> I just had one quick one. So um, you were adding sensitivity for the group buys as well, uh, and it looked like you're just using sensitivity multiplied by how many joins or something. How, how did you do the sensitivity on a group buy? Uh, Isn't it a similar issue to here? A, a, this? To a yeah. So whenever you do a group buy. You double the, the sensitivity that you had before the group buy. That is the rule that we have, and this gives upper bound on the sense of the of the max change after the group buy. Okay. And also, can you explain well, how does this truncation work for this household example you gave? This <coughs> here. Yeah. Like, how do you select this k? You you run the sparse vector technique. Uh, I mean, I don't understand what you mean by that. Because, like, in this household, you want to understand, like, on an average, how many... Like, basically so you would, you, you would ask these queries on the person table, right? Uh -huh. You'd ask how many persons uh -huh. are in a household that has frequency less than i. Uh -huh. And you ask that for i equal to 1. If it's under the threshold, then it goes to i equal to 2, and so on. And this mechanism will give you an answer only one time when it's over the threshold. And that i is, is the threshold that you, you, you will use here. Now, what is threshold? OK, so threshold is your the, th the threshold is a parameter. It will be a parameter. It will be like 95% of the data, or 99% of the data. Let's move to some experiments. I can show you have like some, some other slides later on. I can show you what is the effect of, of this truncation, OK? So as you guys realize, the use case that we used is on the US Census, OK? We have North Carolina data. 
uh, that has uh, to have a, <coughs> a, a database with three tables actually, but only two matter here. We have also a geography table, but it doesn't matter. We have person and household table. Okay, uh, we have five and a half million in person, I think, and two and a half. Uh, yes, five point four in person and two point seven tuples in household. Okay, and we have a total of uh, thir uh, around thirty six hundred queries. Uh, <coughs> that are SQL queries on, the, on this data, okay? Uh, these queries, uh, they might be simple or complex. They look like, they ask like the number of people living in uh, such a household of size, of size three, where a householder is a Hispanic male, okay? So we report the relative error, the relative per query error, okay, over 10 independent trials. And, uh, okay, you don't need to worry about the instantiation. Ah, oh, no, no, you need to worry about the the what is the average number of joins in these queries now? Uh, so I don't know what is the average, but uh, we have a lot of that are like three, four joins, and this in, will incur very high sensitivity. Actually, I have some numbers uh, at the end. We can see the sensitivity of, uh, so we have some certain views, okay? You can see like statistics about these views and the sensitivities, and then from these sensitivities, I can remember how many joins there are. But they're like any, any number between zero and four or five, okay? And the key joins. Uh, they're key, uh, yes, they're key joints, yeah. They're joints on HID and, yeah, they're key joints, yeah. So uh, for this data set where you start with 5.4 megs, mm -hmm. is that what that is, 5.4 uh, 5.4 million tuples in personal oh, database, okay, personal okay. table. Then for the materialized or the, the synopsis, how big is that on disk? They, they, they fit. They're okay. I don't remember the okay. exact, uh, but, but okay. Okay. So, so, so here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Yeah. So, so this is a very good question. I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, I can tell you the following: that certain techniques that we use in the private synopsis generator, they don't use uh, f f flat tables for data representation. They rather use vector representation. Now, the vector representation, this, the size complexity of that, doesn't have to do with uh, the number of tuples, but it has to do with the number of attributes is exponential in the number of attributes, okay? So we have certain views that are very complex and their vector representation <coughs> is maybe um, one gig. Uh, but for most of them, they're small enough that they're like maybe 100 megabytes, okay? okay? Um, but yeah, this is something to consider. Like, and if we don't, if we have other private synopsis generators that are not do vectors, we have like, we have one, one more that does tuples, then the size complexity will be equivalent to, to the data size, yep. not to the, the domain, okay? And something that I want to say about the results that I'm about to show you, here the representative workload that we used is the full workload that we also tested on. And uh, we also have some other experiments later on uh, where the representative workload is much smaller. It's like 30 queries, okay? So <clears throat> these are first result. Uh, y axis is relative per query error. Okay, the policy here is person, and uh, I have, I have, we have stratified the the x axis by the by the true query answer. Okay, so the first column is are all our queries, and then we have queries based on the true query answer. Okay, the the, the main the main thing here ah and the horizontal line at relative error one is the error that a mechanism that always outputs zero would have. And this is an important baseline. It's a sanity. It's like a sanity baseline. If you can't beat that, then there is something wrong, right? <laughs> if you can't beat something that always outputs zero. And actually, this is not 100% correct because some queries have have uh, true answer zero. So this mechanism sometimes is 100% correct. Okay. So <clears throat> first, we see that for around 60% of our queries, our relative error is uh, less than 10%. Okay. This is very and very encouraging. A result because it shows us that there is merit in this approach for actually releasing data, okay? Of course, we have outliers that have a very high relative error. And if, you, if, you, if we could zoom in, we would see that, uh, we can actually see that all these outliers, most of them if, if fall into the first column. These are queries that not only have small query answer, so small signal, but also have very high sensitivity. So w these queries are a little bit unfortunate. We can't do a lot about them, okay? So what is the x-axis and what is the y-axis? x-axis is uh, the groups of queries, right? So these are all our queries here. 
Uh, these are queries that have true query answer between 0 and 1,000, and so on. OK. So if you have like two legends, then what is the, the y-axis? No, no, these are groups of queries. So every point there is a, is a, is a single query. Is a query that, that whose true answer falls into this uh, bucket. So the y value of y axis is a relative error. Yeah. And y axis is a relati relative error. So, so when you say 40%, you're saying if you take the 10 to the negative 1, that 40% is above that and 60% yeah, yeah, yeah. is below. Yeah, like this, this is 50% here, so I would guess that 60% is there. OK. So every point here, every blue point, is an outlier query. And the, the box plots fit the percentiles of the relative errors inside, OK? Next, we can change policy. And from person policy, go to household policy. And here we see similar trends, but now every error is boosted. You can see like there is a clear boost of, of, of the errors, OK? And this is explained because you know, removing a household has bigger effect in the, in the query answers than removing a single person, OK? But we can still see that, OK, at least we're beating the zero baseline, OK? Uh, for our next ex uh, experiment, we compare with, um, with Flex. And Flex is a one query at a time, and we did all queries together. Uh, so we adapted it a little bit. We just run Flex by splitting the, our privacy budget across every single query. OK. So some of the queries that uh, we submitted, some, some of the 3,600 queries, uh, could not be supported from Flex. So uh, we just excluded them from this plot. And also, plot, uh, Flex only supports person's policy, not, uh, not uh, household policy. OK. Again, we stratify uh, our results by true query answers. And you can see that, again, the, the, the black line is baseline 0. And you can see that every blue box performs very badly. And uh, now the y-axis, the relative error, goes to 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 2, goes very large for flex. OK. And our error is still as good as it was earlier. Now, this huge difference in, in error comes from three factors, OK? First of all, we, we answer our queries based on these synopsis that are generated from views. So we just paid privacy budget one time to, to, compute the, to compute the view. Not every time we want to compute a uh, query, OK? And a lot of queries will be answered from the same view. Secondly, as we saw earlier, we have a tighter sensitivity analysis, OK? So like this 2F and 3F business matters here a lot. And lastly, um, flex, they do, uh, the elastic sensitivity is, is abound on the, on the local sensitivity. So afterwards, they need to do smoothing. And smoothing also matters. Um, it, you add a lot of noise. We don't do smoothing. We truncate instead. We don't get so much error. OK. And this concludes with uh, the main results. We have more results for later on if you guys want. And some stuff to talk about what we're doing now and what we want to do. So we would like to have policies that extend to multiple primary private relations. So imagine like a more complex schema. And you can decide that uh, you know, both my employees and my employers are going to be primary private. Okay, And then you find, the, you find the policy there, what's happening. I would like to support bigger uh, SQL uh, subset, bigger SQL uh, grammar for both our view selector and our uh, query answering engine. For example, how to answer this query, the average of salary, is, is a pretty interesting question. We're working on that. And uh, we want to have the other two things. Maybe they're like too optimistic. But we want to have like a new synopsis, a synopsis updater. So if fresh queries comes that are, un are un unanswered, or fresh data comes, or a fresh epsilon comes, how would you update your already released synopsis? under this unified epsilon, right? And the other thing uh, is that we would like to have not, not only give query answers, like we do here, but also give error bounds for these query answers. And again, how to do this is, is unknown territory. Because even to provide the error bound, you need to look at the data. Uh, how, how do you do that? Like, it's, it's not super obvious. OK. And also, we have. We still have ongoing work about how to make uh, tighter sensitivity analysis, either with better rules or with uh, adding more logic to the view writer. So we've seen examples 
where the same SQL query has two different query plans, and the sensitivity calculation will give two different numbers. So this gives us, tells us something that maybe we could write a view writer that optimizes with respect to sensitivity, finds an optimal plan for that. And I would like to thank my colleagues, Yu Cao, Xi, and then Michael and Jerome, and of course in the middle my, my, my advisor, Ashwin, and who, who has pushed everybody to, for, for this work, yeah. Inspired us. Any questions to yours? Yeah, you mentioned earlier um, that one of the benefits of doing this approach of synopsis is uh, side channel resistance. Is, is the idea that the it's done out, side channel resistance means side channel outside of, or inside the firewall, or so, outside the firewall. That, like, so, like somebody could look at your algorithm as it's running and guess what it's doing, but yeah. you're saying it's that's in a protected box? So, uh, first of all, our algorithm should be transparent, okay? You don't have uh, privacy by obscurity. We all know that, right? Secondly, there, there exist attacks. What, what I mean by side channel attack? Okay, so you have the algorithm ins inside the privacy firewall. But if, if you are in an online query answering system uh, and your algorithm is, for example, DAWA, and I know that because I've run the experiment myself, for certain data, DAWA will take longer to run because it needs to run some optimization program, okay? For some other data, it won't run this optimization program. So you don't even need to look at the query answers to understand that the data looked like this because now it took, it took this algorithm more time. Right. So this is the side channel attacks that an offline... Um, Got it. So, so you're not talking about side channel during the synopsis generation? No, no, okay. no. Okay. The synopsis generation, uh, we it's close the doors, we wait one hour, we wait an hour and we say, okay, now, now we're done. Yeah, the data collector is trusted. Yes, the data collector is trusted, yeah. yeah. Like the providing the, the error bounds, I guess the issue is like, I mean, so if systems like Flex, they, they can give you the error bound because they can tell you which distribution there's something. Here, the trouble comes exactly from the fact that you don't so, know what you're dropping. Like, because they, because they, because they have two sources of error. So one is, of course, the noise, but the other one is, is that in order to handle joins, you constrain the data and you drop away pieces of your own data. That is what leads to make Oh, yeah, okay, I have a counterpoint to that. So Flex does Laplace mechanism with scale sigma, and sigma you compute it, it's free information, so that sigma can give you the error bound, right? Yeah. If you know the loss function, if your loss function is relative error, you still cannot give error bound for the relative error. Yeah, relative bound, absolutely. So yeah. the error bound not only depends on the mechanism itself, because if you have a mechanism symbol like that does, does Laplace noise, you, your error bound is going to be the sigma, right? The scale of the Laplace noise. But also it needs to depend on the error function that you actually compute. But the absolute error, I mean, because I think in most cases when you talk about counts, it's the absolute error that, that matters. Right? Yeah, if it's, if it's the absolute error, then yes, with a mechanism like Flex, you could do it. With mechanisms like ours, you cannot do it because in the synopsis generation phase, our, our algorithms, for example, the DAWA that I mentioned, they're data dependent. That means that even for absolute error, the error still depends on the input. Yeah, okay. Yes. So this is so our our, our whole our, this whole work is we do we're still data dependent our error is still data dependent mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So can you comment a bit on like is there any overlap with your techniques with the techniques of AQP yeah, like approximate query processing and all that like there are, there are a lot of similar terms. Right? Yeah, Not we we have. Use. Yeah, we have explored this connection in the past. We didn't come up with something, but uh, you know, in AQP, uh, you don't have privacy budget. You have maybe computational constraints or time constraints. No, I understand that. Yeah. I'm just saying that are there techniques in common, and you have more things to ensure privacy. Or yeah, we haven't. Even we haven't, you can yeah, we uh, haven't use explored techniques that. which, because the trade-offs are different here. Yeah, it looks similar, especially if you do something like workload, uh, the workload non-negative like least squares, that looks very similar to that, but we haven't taken techniques um, directly from that uh, part of literature. Do you have slides um, or, or a paper that talks about the relative processing time and the relative storage? No. Uh, no? Okay. No. 
I have the numbers at the top of my head, and maybe okay. I can less on my machine back in Durham and tell you. What that seems like the like one of the more interesting ones from an engineering or like a deployment standpoint. It's like if it's three orders of magnitude versus not, then you know. Yeah, that's that's if a that's a very good point. You can put it on your slides and share with us. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I can probably uh, afterwards I can probably find these numbers, okay. but uh, they really depend on what is your private synopsis generator. Yeah, and it sounds, and for like, it example, sounds like it depends on like the dimensionality of like some of the. It depends first of all on the choice, and then the dimensionality of the domain. So the the, the cross domain cross attributes, yeah. right? Okay. And um, yeah, because for example, this for these thirty six hundred queries, you have seventeen views that capture all of them. So you need to materialize seventeen views. So it's a small number on the one hand. And most of them are pretty small, but I have one view that has a domain half a million, right? Yeah. If it has domain half a million, imagine a vector with half a million counts. So yeah. okay. If it fits in memory, we uh, everything fits in memory. So far, my memory in that fine. machine is yeah. 16 yeah. Gig gigabytes. That's fine, yeah. So, yeah. So let's thank you us again.